we'll just look at verse 10. That'll be the focus of our attention. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the friend that we have in the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he stood for us on Golgotha. We thank you that he stands reigning at the right hand. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come and walk among us here as we're gathered in these strange circumstances. But may we still sense you brushing up against our pant legs and our skirts and whatever it is that we're doing, our pajamas or our robes. Please, Lord Jesus, meet with us. Harbor Church, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a while back, my wife Diane and I watched a movie that was set in post-World War II in that era in the Jim Crow South. And in the movie, a poor and struggling African-American man and his family were valiantly working hard to get economic stability for themselves in the South. But late one night, a band of white sheet-wearing, pointed hat donning Ku Klux Klan Klansmen made a visit to their rural home and they poured gasoline all around. And when everything was soaked, they set the house ablaze. To their delight, but to the sheer horror of the rudely awakened family and the household. It was just outrageous, an ugly thing to behold. Well, the church is the household of God, it says in Ephesians 2. And this era we find ourselves in is the COVID-19 pandemic era where we're quarantined and we're separated now from one another. But our lurking enemy is a grand wizard adversary with more hordes of assistance than the KKK ever had and he's the devil. He's Satan. He's always, as the scriptures say, prowling around seeking whom he may destroy. Now, I just want you to know that as your pastor, regarding the household of Harbor, I smell gas. And I want to talk to you about it a little bit. The devil's oily tactics and aroma, which we are to be hawkishly aware of, it says in 2 Corinthians 2 that we're not unaware of his schemes, his tactics are always to create division. In fact, think of his premiere on the stage of the Garden of Eden where he showed himself doing what between Adam and Eve who were married, the two became one flesh. He divided them to the point where here we have Adam charging Eve and blame shifting the woman that you gave me. Division between the first man and the first woman. And then in Genesis 3, there was division between the two brothers, Cain and Abel, because sin, which would have been Satan, was crouching at Cain's door. And we even think of how in the book of 1 Corinthians, we see that the brotherly union of Christians in Corinth was being attacked, as it says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Brethren, I exhort you that there be no divisions among you. Why? Because you could smell gas present there in Corinth. So Satan is a divisive arson. He loves to set blazes like a pyromaniac and then to stand at a distance and watch the household go up in flames as he cackles on the sidewalk out in front. And it's outrageous, the tactics of the enemy. Well, the places of perceived threat in our Harbor Church are these. Let me just give you my pastor's heart, what I see, what I smell. Think of, oh, we could say even in our marriages, the enemy can be driving division during this COVID-19 era. I read a Gospel Coalition 
blog just this week. It was called Help for Quarantine Marriages by Jeff and Sarah Walton. And they said this, these are uncharted waters with plans and routines and expectations being turned on their heads. Temptations and challenges naturally arise in our marriages because each spouse processes situations during COVID-19 differently and it's too easy to take out our frustrations and our anxieties on one another. So in marriages there can be division, right, Elizabeth? Well, also, there can be division even amid siblings. Zach and Oliver, you think of this. You're all stuck in a house now instead of going out every day. You're in tight quarters, and your schedules are scrambled, and there's limited screen time. Right, guys? And you can have selfish agendas, and petty arguments can arise between you, and it can make you guys to be acting like Cain and Abel clones toward one another. Or... Even between parents and children. Parents can be real stressed during this time. Parents, instead of working at the office, some are working at home. And the workload can be heavy. And their children are around. And they've got to get up early, right? They've got to stay to their school schedules and their classwork. And that can create tension and relationship breakdown between parents and their children. But really, those familial things aren't my main concern when I say I smell gasoline around Harbor Church. My gaze is fixed on what could be called inter-member fellowship. That's the relationship between us as members of Harbor. Yes, even during COVID-19, this era. Because there's this upheaval that's brought certain legion issues of controversy into our relationships that can divide Harbor Church, frankly, into countless little pieces of division. Think a number of issues that have arisen during COVID-19. There's the, should we even assemble issue that has arisen among us. There can be differences of opinion. One might say, oh, the government has no right to prohibit our worshiping together. Or someone else might say, well, we threaten and spread the virus even by live streaming and having a few people together here. Or some would say we should reopen earlier. And some would say, no, we should reopen later. And then think of when we do reopen. What if we reopened on the first Sunday of May? Oh, God willing, if we did it, how are we going to do it? How are we going to be six feet apart from each other when the greeter stands in the lobby? And where are the chairs going to be? And should we use the annex? Should we use the balcony? And the devil's in the details. And there can be all kinds of disagreements among us regarding these things. One would say, we must forsake not the assembling together. But another says, but it says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. And these things can be tension building and dividing among ourselves? Or how about the, should we support the governor's lockdown issue? In Michigan here, that's arisen. One might say, she's gone too far, and she deserves our righteous protest. Or someone else in Harbor Church might say, no, she's our God-ordained authority, and she deserves our humble submission. There can be tension, right, in Harbor Church. Or how about the, we should get back to work issue, or should we? Uh, one might say, if we really had love and compassion of Jesus, we wouldn't go back to work. we just strictly quarantine. But then there may be others in Harbor Church who say, well, if we really love the brethren, we should fire up the economy and get people back to work so they can provide for their families. There's difference of opinion. On that, that could create divisions in Harbor Church. Or what about the should we vaccinate issue? If there's a COVID-19 vaccination, some may say vaccines are necessary to keep the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. And it's reckless to endanger others by not getting vaccinated. 
if a vaccine does arise. In fact, there was somebody, in fact, it was a pastor in an Ohio church I talked to this week said there were people he knew of were saying, I'm not going to that church if they're not all vaccinated. Really? But then on the other hand, there can be the view that says vaccines harm health. They promote autism. They enlist unethical ingredients. In fact, that same pastor said there are other people who say, if anybody in that church gets vaccinated, I'm not going to that church. And then some may say, vaccinations. That just buys into the whole Bill Gates plan to computer chip us all with a big mark brother, big brother mark, and we'd have the mark of the beast on us. Controversies among the church. Or how about this one? The should we celebrate the Lord's table issue? Some may say, come on, pastor. When we had Zoom meeting first Sunday of April, we should have all done the Lord's table together, every family having bread and fruit of the vine. Someone else says, no, 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 no. You can't have the Lord's table simply as a home, independent Bible study relationship without pastors and a covenanted church. It must be only the church together that celebrates the Lord's table. Controversy there, right? And then, what if on the first Sunday of May we do have the Lord's table? And when we get together, we've got to be sanitary. Can we really have the Lord's table? I don't think so, some might say. Yes, but the Lord says that we are to often celebrate the Lord's table. Well, shall we have pre-packaged Ziploc packets? And someone says, no, because if we had that, it wouldn't be the full one loaf symbolism. No way I'd partake in that. See what I'm saying? Oliver and Zach? <laughs> How there can be conflicts and divisions and tensions. I know this is an extended introduction. I understand that. But we want to set the field for the issues we're addressing here at Harbor Church. These differences of opinion can kindle our passions, right? And we can even have fiery emotions because we hold deep conviction about these things. And these are the things that can set Harbor Church ablaze with divisions. And the enemy delights in it. But our Savior is grieved by it. And so, I just want to bring to Harbor Church, to our house, a better-than-bucket brigade to put out these fires a high-pressure hose, a fire extinguisher to foil the enemy, to delight the Savior, and to bless us all. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. We're going to unpack it in three main headings. Three main headings. Having had that extended introduction, now consider these three main headings. And the first will be the triple exhortation. The triple exhortation. Look what it says there in 1.10 of 1 Corinthians. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. He says, I exhort you. It's a call to unity, isn't it? The apostle has been away probably five years since he planted the church in Corinth. And now he's compelled to write. And we notice it wasn't heresy that compelled him. It wasn't apostasy that compelled him. It was disunity. And so he brings a triple exhortation to them. And notice the threefold purposes. The first of the three is to have one voice. I exhort you, brethren, to have one voice. Literally, it says that you all agree, or even more literally, that you say the same thing. The reason why is because there were rival snow slogans among them, right? Look at verse 12. It says, some of you say, I am of Paul. And others say, I am of Apollos. And others say, I am of Cephas. They weren't all speaking with one voice. They should have been all saying, 
I am of Christ. Harbor Church could do that very thing too. That kind of lining up behind other shameful rivalries. But there's only one single rallying voice that is suitable for a true Christian church. And that is, we're of Christ. And so there's distinctions among them. And he exhorts them that they would all agree as to have one voice. But now look secondly at this triple exhortation. Also, to have no factions. To have no factions. It says there, that there be no divisions. That word divisions is the Greek word schemata, from which we get schism. Like the same word is used in Mark 2, 21, where it speaks of the new patch sewn onto an old garment. It says a worse tear. Ah, there's the word schismata. A worse tear results. So Paul is saying, I would that there would be no tears among you. In fact, the same theme is present in Matthew 19, verse 6, where it says, man and woman become one flesh. The two become one flesh. Let no man rend asunder. Let no man tear them asunder. There's body imagery, even in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, just a few chapters later here, how you are all members of one body. So Paul is saying, look, you in Corinth there, let there be no tears. Don't be acting with each other according to a cannibalistic harshness, like amputating one another, tearing one another apart, limb from limb. That would be barbaric cruelty among you and folly. Let there be no tares among you. But the apostle is also saying that, we you know, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put broken Humpty together again. Paul is saying there is a way for you to be knitted back together again. And the great physician, the Lord Jesus, who rules over the body of Christ, is able to do that. So, this triple exhortation, to have one voice, to have no factions, but then thirdly, to have one mind. To have one mind. Paul says, I exhort you that you may be complete. In fact, that word is actually mended. It's the Greek word kartizo, that you be mended. The same word is used in Mark 1.19 when James and John were in their boat. What were they doing? They were mending their nets. Cartizo, same word. And so Paul says, I would that you would be mended. You realize in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the wear and tear of congregational and body life, we, we always can tear one another. And, but just like the fishermen, you always got to be mending the nets. That's just part of congregational life, to be mending, cartizoing one another back together Again, And it also says there, having the same mind. It's the word nous in the Greek. The same word is used in 2.16 where it says, but we have the mind of Christ. We're not supposed to each have our own separate minds. It's my mind and it's my opinion. But no, we're called upon to have one mind, the same mind. And that would be the mind of Christ. And we find Philippians 4, 2 and verse 5 says that, have this attitude, the mind, the attitude of Christ, which would be esteeming others more highly than ourselves in our own opinion. So the supremacy of the mind of Christ is to give us a sameness of mind, where it says also, and that you are also to have the same judgment. Like that word could be translated the same opinion. It's the same word used in 1 Corinthians 7, 25, when Paul says regarding marriage, this is my opinion, but I think I too have the spirit, he says. The same judgment. Or it's even the same word used in Philemon 14, where Paul asks that Philemon would have the same opinion as him regarding emancipating the slave Onesimus. Would you please have my opinion? Would you have my consent on this matter, Philemon? 
So the point Paul is making is, when he calls them to be united, they're to bend their tempers and their convictions. I have my mind and you have your mind, but to bend it all for the sake of peace. In fact, in summarizing this triple exhortation, Matthew Henry says, the consideration of being agreed in greater things, like we're united in Christ, should extinguish all feuds and divisions regarding minor things. So, you know what? It's my liberty to think it, but it's also my liberty to just set it aside for the sake of unity and having the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Harvard Church and Corinth Church, every hill is not a hill to die on and to damage the body of Christ for. So, so that's the triple exhortation. But come on with me now to the triple motivation of this passage, the triple motivation. We ask, oh, come on, Pastor Mark, why, why would I be willing to suppress my deep opinions and my passionate convictions? And Paul inspires them here to do this, and he pries them from their proud selfishness with three levers here. This, this triple motivation. The first is, Paul, your pastor. That's one motivation that he uses. I'm your pastor, Paul, he says. He says, look, I beseech you. That pronoun is important. I beseech you, or I exhort you. Paul's bringing his own personality into this, his relationship with those in Corinth. In Philemon 19, Paul says this to Philemon. He's trying to persuade him to his opinion. And he says, not to mention, Philemon, that you owe me your very life. So could you put it on my tab and set an SMS free? What he's saying is, Philemon, for my sake, patch it up with Onesimus. Okay? And that's what Paul is saying to those in Corinth. You saints in Corinth, you have difficulties. For my sake, patch it up between y'all there. John Flavel, the old Puritan, says this on this. The great apostle is here on his knees before them, meekly and pathetically pleading with them to unite. He says, I was the instrument in Christ's hand to birth you. I planted your church. In fact, that's referred to in 3.6 of 1 Corinthians. I planted your church, Corinth. So by the tender ties between you and me, grant my request. You see how he's intruding his personal relationship into this. It's like Galatians 4.16 where Paul says, I'm in childbirth, Galatians, until Christ be formed in you. For my sake, Corinthians, Patch it up among each other. So it's, it's, it's the pastor, your pastor motivation. But the second motivation is brothers, your brothers motivation. That's where he says, I beseech you or exhort you brethren or brothers. That's the Greek word adelphoi. You've heard Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Well, that's what's at stake here. Corinth should be the church of brotherly love among brothers. Why? Because we're brothers in Christ. We were born again by the same Spirit. We, we, we shared the same womb together, gestated by the Spirit of God, born again to a new life into the family of God. Remember back in Genesis 43, how Joseph, finally down in Egypt there, at that banquet table, saw his brother Benjamin. And they had shared the same womb, hadn't they? They had shared the same womb together, the same mom. And what happened to Joseph when he laid eyes on his womb-sharing brother? He said he had to depart and go into the next room, and he wailed aloud because of his affection for his womb-sharing brother. See, brothers have a soft place for one another, don't they? That's what Paul is doing when he says, I exhort you, brothers. Just to confess, from the family, Chansky, 
A few Christmases ago, we had a blow-up at a family reunion. Whole family was together, the sons and their wives and daughter and husband, and we were all together, but there was a controversy that arose. And before I knew it, as a dad at my house, my household was up in flames, and the devil was cackling at the argument that had arisen among us. But praise God, there was a wonderful reconciliation that took place. I still remember sitting in our big living room at our house, and uh, one of the older brothers said to one of the younger brothers, he looked at him and he said, hey, I'm tears running down his cheeks. Hey, I'm always going to be there for you. You're my brother. Talk about Joseph having to leave the room. I had to leave the room because I was overwhelmed with a sense of joy with this brotherly affection. And that's what should take place among us. Harbor Church, just like in Corinth. John Flabel says this, brotherhood is an enduring thing and naturally draws affection and unity with it. And Matthew Henry says, when there's not unity of mind among us, there should still be unity of affections among us here at Harbor Church. It says in 1 Peter 3, 8, be harmonious with each other, be sympathetic. And it says, be brotherly. <laughs> you know what that means? Be affectionate with one another. Be kind-hearted. It says, humble in spirit. Because in 1 Peter, the first chapter, it says, because you have the same father. You call on the same father. It also says, you have the same inheritance. You are brothers. And like it says in Psalm 133, oh, when brothers dwell together in unity, it's what? It's like the oil on Aaron's head, so soothing. Like the dew on Mount Hermon, so sparkling and beautiful. And it delights our Heavenly Father, who doesn't go to another room, but He stays in the room with us when we dwell together in brotherly unity. So He's giving us motivations. And the first motivation to be united is, I'm Paul, your pastor. Secondly, brothers, your brothers. Thirdly, notice, Christ, your Savior. Christ your Savior. Look what he says there. I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just one more account from the Chansky family archives. About one year ago, you may have remembered I had a big bandage on my forehead. It's because I was downstairs in our basement, and I, I turned and I banged my forehead up against the wall. You'd think after a quarter of a century, I'd know where the walls of my house are. But I said, honey, look, I just banged, I banged into a wall and a big split in my forehead. It just said split, torn, wide open. And I uh, put some butterflies on there, butterfly bandages. And I thought, oh, this is going to be, should I go into the emergency room and get it sutured? No, Diane said it's going to be okay, maybe. So I put the butterflies on for two or three days and I didn't touch it. And then when I finally took the butterfly bandage off, I thought, oh, it's going to split. But there was this wonderful gooey blood paste that was better than crazy glue. And it held the tear together in place. And so Flavel says this, listen to this. There's a mystical union between believers. They're glued together by the blood of Christ. <sighs> That's the way it is. Be united, he says, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he says in Philippians 2, if there be any consolation in Christ, Yodian Syntyche, you're split. Be glued together by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Smear the blood of Christ onto that division. So if there's a division between us, let's say it's division about the, the governor and her policy. We say, hey, between the two of us, we have differences of opinion. But hey, the gospel trumps the governor. Here at Harbor Church, we're brothers. That brother that I could be irritated with? What? My Savior died for that man. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. Uh, my Savior, my Savior went and found him. 
He was lost and Jesus found him and Jesus put him on his shoulders. He bled and died for my brother. He's my fellow soldier in Christ. We hear about soldiers, don't we? Leave no man in the battlefield. Whatever it takes, if I have to go and fight through hell to get my brother and hold him dearly, I'll do it because the blood of Christ heals the deepest scars and tears between us. As we say regarding the difference that I may have with you, Oliver, or you, Zach, I say Jesus prayed about us. When he was in Gethsemane, he, play, he prayed. And on that night of Gethsemane, the night he sweated blood, he prayed, Father, I pray that they would be one. Remember the upper room prayer? And he said, Father, I pray that I would be in them, that you would be in me, and that they would be perfected in unity. And Christ went off with his blood, and he was scourged, and his blood poured out. And he was crowned with nails, and his blood poured out. And he had nails through his hands, and his blood poured out. And the love of Christ constrains us then, doesn't it? As brothers in Christ. Just kind of casts a spell over us. In fact, it's interesting how true Christians have that spell cast over them regarding their brothers and sisters with each other. So much so that John Flavlew comments on this passage. He said, if there isn't this kind of brotherly love between Christians, he wonders if there's even spiritual life in them. He says this, where John says in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But their going out from us showed they were not of us. And Flavel says the chief issue for them was not so much heresy, but it was a lack of solidarity. That, that they displayed that they weren't truly lovers of Christ because of their divisive spirit. You know, there can be people who are shibboleth folk. Always having a differences of opinion here and there on periphery issues. You know, there can be folks. Do you know this? There, there can be folks who can have the habit of leaving a church. A habit. Leaving a church at the drop of a hat. And Flavel says there's a lack of adhesive affection there. And Flavel says, I wonder if they're even friends of Christ. So, so that's the triple motivation. So we've expounded our passage. We've seen the triple motivation and the triple exhortation. But now just come with me, just before we close now, to the quintuple application. The quintuple application. Yes, Oliver, it's a word. It means five pieces. The quintuple application. Based on this exposition, <clears throat> let me just bring some things that church unity requires. First, Knowing Savior intimacy. Knowing Savior intimacy. If we're spiritually near to Christ, you know what that'll make us? To draw near to one another. Like it says in Philippians 2, if there's any consolation in Christ, be like-minded. I know what you're thinking, but, but, but he thinks Governor Whitmer's lockdown is wise. And we, we, we need to get back to work instead of quarantine. Or he refuses vaccinations. Or she refuses vaccinations. Or, or how about this? He prefers Cephas to Apollos. Or, or he thinks we should assemble for the Lord's table on May 3. And I don't think so. And we can in our hearts say, such differences of opinion and relational irritations are insurmountable. I can't put up with that person. I don't think that is the mind of Christ at all. Because look at, just, just think with me. Look at how Christ puts up with you every day. Think of how rudely you treat him every day. A thousand times a day you trample on your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he continues to put up with you. I know it because he keeps putting up with me as well. And I say that 
we must know Savior intimacy because we must have that kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we're strangers to him. Don't, don't you know that Christ has to constantly forgive you and forbear with you? You know that if you have closet devotional conversations with him. You know that if you have pillow talks with him. You know that if you have conscience convictions from him. You know that if Jesus is your soul mate, because you know he endures constantly. Even like it says in Ephesians 4.30, Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, of Christ, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Christ so tenderly puts up with me, so I must put up with my brothers and my sisters. Flavel says this, Brethren, if you'd study how to frustrate and grieve the heart of the Lord Jesus, whom you profess to love, you can't take a readier way to do it than by breaking bonds of unity among yourselves. Don't grieve Christ. Have intimacy with him. Do what Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree that there be no divisions among you, that you have the same mind and same judgment. But secondly, of our five, having seen, knowing Savior intimacy, seeking God's glory. Seeking God's glory. Instead of our imbibing in a self-idolatry that enthrones myself, and says, curse be everybody who doesn't agree with me. Am I the only one who can have a tendency to do that in my own life? I don't think I'm alone in this. I scold myself. Mark, who do you think you are to act like? Who do you think you are? Are you God? Is it all about you, Mark? No, it's not all about me. It's about the Lord. That's why Paul says in Romans 15, 5, now may the God of patience, it says, grant you to be of the same mind with one another, listen now, that you may with one voice glorify your God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we speak with one voice, we glorify God. In contrast to glorifying ourselves. And God loves harmony. When you play, Anna and Andrew, when you play, I love the, the harmony that you create. When someone drops something, or if there would be a, a clanking of a kitchen pan here, it'd be a cacophony, and it stirs and disturbs everyone else. That's what it is when we're arguing. We're not being harmonious, and God does not like the sound. It doesn't glorify Him. But the Lord loves it, like it says in Psalm 133, when brethren dwell together in unity. So let everything that is breath... 150th Psalm, praise the Lord and not peeve the Lord. Let us glorify him with all of our talking interactions. Because pride, seeking to glorify myself instead of God, it pushes the limits of God's long-suffering. In the men's breakfast uh, three or four weeks ago, God hates certain things, seven things he hates. And what's the ultimate? One who causes trouble with his brothers in Proverbs chapter 6. You think of even the rebellion of Korah in Numbers chapter 16. You know what happened to Korah, Oliver? You know. The earth opened up and swallowed him. Now, if that isn't a picture of God hating disunity, I don't know what is. So, may we be resolved to seek God's Glory. No factions among us. But, but thirdly, come on, thirdly with me. Exercising brotherly sensitivity. Exercising brotherly or sisterly sensitivity. You know, the scriptures don't say that our opinions and our convictions are irrelevant. I think it's okay to relate our opinions to one another. Because some of them are based on moral absolutes. Like... You say, but this issue, Pastor Mark, the sanctity of life is at stake. That's good. 
have convictions about that. Or this issue, it's the we must obey God rather than man principle that's at stake. Where this principle, it's love your brother, your neighbor, it's at stake. With this principle, it's caring for the poor and oppressed is at stake. Or maybe an opinion. How do we best care for the poor and oppressed? And there are differences of opinions on that. Or forsake not the assembling. That's at stake. See, all of these issues are worthy of probing and sharing among each other at Harbor Church. However, Romans 14, 1 speaks of regarding opinions and disputable matters. These are issues worth probing and discussing, but not worth drawing swords against another and dividing camps among each other. Oh, but Pastor, but Pastor Mark, I, I have convictions. And I think it's true. It's good to be expressing those convictions. But it's not good to be distressing relationships in the church over those convictions. Because when there's a conviction collision with a brother, I think it's healthy to debate back and forth. But after that debate, there needs to be a warm conclusion. In fact, even this week I had a conclusion with someone else, a discussion with someone else. Warm conclusion to the conversation. But then, oh, when I came away from that conversation, it's like the crock pot that you have. It begins to stew, and I thought, oh, here's an article I could send this person. <laughs> or here's an argument that I could bring against this person. My mind wanted to go back and to, to irritate the issue. My wife used to go walk our golden retriever named Shasta. And Shasta used to go to road, used to go to road kill on the side of the road. And then would say, Shasta, leave it! Shasta, leave it! I need to say, Mark, leave it! <laughs> Just leave it, Mark. See, brothers and sisters can be dry piles of leaves in a drought. When we talk to each other, we should avoid unnecessary sparks that can set the church and relationships ablaze. That's why it says in Proverbs 15, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Even think of in 1 Samuel 25, David's coming down from the mountainside angry he's going to kill the house of Nabal and Abigail with a very quiet and gentle spirit disarms angry David. And we should seek to disarm one another. In fact, there was a brother I talked to this week, and he said something about a post that I put on Facebook. And, you know, I said, I, yeah, I got that one wrong, I think. And I, I deleted it from Facebook. But then the argument that I, no, leave it, Mark. Just, just, just leave it. Because foolish and wicked men inflame others passions. But like it says in 2 Timothy 2, the Lord's bondservant must not quarrel, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting. So let's have brotherly sensitivity. But fourthly, fourthly and quickly, understanding church authority. Understanding church authority. Some issues are not to be church-regulated. With some issues, it would be wrong for the church to take a stand and officially intrude in. Because, listen, there's a word I'm going to use, a phrase. We must respect sphere sovereignties. That's a phrase from Abraham Kuyper. That's the man who said, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. It's all Christ, and he rules over it all. But the reality is, these authorities are distributed differently in different intersecting circles. If you could throw that little graph on there, Blake. The point is that there's the sphere of the church, and the sphere of the family, and the sphere of the state, and they do overlap at places but they are different areas of authority. So it is wise to educate and clarify salt and light issues on these things, talk about them, but we realize that the state, Washington and Lansing, has a certain area of authority. Then the family, a husband, a father, has a certain authority. 
then the church has another area of authority. But understand that the church is not to take a stand or dictate to families on liberty discernment issues. Just very practically. Listen up now. Very, very practically. We're not going to take a stand on certain liberty discernment issues, such as education. How do you educate your children? Different ways you could. Or procreation. Or vaccination. Or lactation. We're not going to take a stand on those things. It's not, it's not our business. Those are family issues. It's not for the church to take a stand. Yes, there are areas where the church must decide. But even then realize it's not majority rule. It's, it's, it's elder rule. Just like it's father or husband rule in a home. It's also pastors have responsibilities within churches. So we pray. And please you pray that, that we'd be given wisdom as pastors on these kinds of issues, all kinds of issues that we need as pastors to make decisions on. Pray that you'd lovingly extend your counsel to us. And pray that you'd kindly trust your pastor's judgment. This is a crucial as a formula for church unity as opposed to Christ dishonoring divisions. Now, let me just read from Mark Dever. He writes about that passage in Hebrews 13, 17, where it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Obey them so that they might do their work with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Dever says this, This passage contains some words we aren't used to hearing. Words like obey and submit and obey. He says, it is often said that trust must be earned, and I understand what that means, but that's only half true. Of course, when we recognize leaders in the church, as in any other sphere of life, we want them to be people who seem capable of holding responsibilities, and Paul himself lays out some qualifications. At the same time, listen to what Deborah says, at the same time, however, the kind of trust that we are called to give to our fellow imperfect humans like elders in this life and even to leaders in the church, can never finally be earned. It must be given as a gift. So we are such fallible leaders, but we ask that you would give us the gift of trusting us when pastoral judgment calls have to be made. I plead with you, as a, your pastor for a quarter of a century, I plead with you that Harbor would be of one mind in these things. Just in conclusion... Preserving gospel testimony is at stake. Realize that we stand before a watching world as Harbor Church. If we are a constantly dividing church, we, we ladle on the gospel that we profess a certain oily stench about us that people want nothing to do with us. You know how it says in the scriptures how Better a millstone, Matthew 18, but better a millstone be tied around the neck than one of these little ones be stumbled. Realize that if we're having an argument out in front on the yard in Douglas Avenue and people passing by see us arguing with each other, do you think they want our gospel? No, there's a stench about it. They have nothing to do with us if they hear that we're an arguing church. Or even think of the little ones like Oliver and Zach or Jane in our church. And how if they see us arguing, not out front, but in the lobby, or in the annex, arguing with one another, this puts a stench on the gospel. You, many children raised in churches are cynical, and they want nothing to do with the gospel because we've stumbled them by our what? Having divisions among ourselves. But in contrast, think of what it says in Acts chapter 2, where it says, Day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, taking meals together with gladness, in sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And it says, the Lord was adding to their numbers daily those who were being saved. People see that. You know what they say? I want a piece of that real estate. 
I want to be a part of that household. Because when brothers dwell together in unity, there the Lord commands the blessing. Our Father is united. and He comes in this upper room and he meets with us and he dwells with us. May that be our lot here at Harbor Church. Not divisions, but having the mind of Christ together. Let's close with a final hymn.